Okay. That's what I really had to say about what's going on in the industry, how this could benefit your practice, how this could benefit yourself. Now I want to talk specifically about what is the CFP process. There's something that's called the four E's. The CFP Board of Standards, in order to become a certificate holder, you have to complete an education program, you have to pass the national exam, you have to adhere to a code of ethics, and you need experience. And I'm going to break down each one of these four E's in a little bit more detail for you. First of all, education. In order to sit for the exam, it really is a two-step process. You have to complete the education in a board-registered program. All of our programs are board-registered. On curriculum that's approved by the CFP board, those 89 topics that I talked about. Now, one little thing that I will mention is there is the ability to what's called challenging the exam, which means you can altogether skip step one if you already have a degree such as a CPA, JD, CFA, you, you can see them listed there. The one word of caution that I would have, uh, just because you're a potential challenge candidate, you need to make sure that you know those 89 topics very, very well. And I'll, I'll choose CPA here for, for a second. Let's say that you're a CPA and you have a very good individual tax practice you work with individuals on a full-time basis, you are going to understand taxes very, very well, probably way beyond the scope of what you need to know for the CFP examination. But the tax section is only 14% of the exam. If you're not well-versed in all the other sections, you're not going to pass the exam. And quite frankly, challenge candidates have a less than 30% pass rate. So even if you are a challenge candidate, you may look at the list of courses that I'm going to go through, and it might behoove you to take some of those courses that might be outside of your current practice area. The other thing that I wanted to mention to you is that um, the requirements for the 89 topics are in existence. In addition, the CFP board announced earlier this year that they're going to have a required uh, comprehensive case course beginning in 2012 at some time. They haven't come out with much specifics, but um, they are going to be changing some of the requirements. So if you're thinking about certification, you might think about it now um, before the 2012 uh, changes occur. Okay, second step in the process is examination. There is a national examination that's offered three times a year, always March, November, and July. It is a multiple choice pencil paper type question. There's no essays, there's no written component to that. There are case studies, as I've indicated here, but the case studies, you get eight or ten pages of information and then you answer multiple choice questions on that case. It is rigorous, ten hour examination, Friday night, four hours, Saturdays, there's two, three hour sessions. The location of the exam is determined by the board. I, they have it in about 50 locations across the U.S., uh, those three times a year. And in order to apply to take the national certification exam, you have to prove to them that you've completed the required education or that you are a challenge candidate. Okay. Third E, once you've completed step one and step two successfully, you have to have the required experience in order to call yourself a CFP certificate holder. And that requires three years of full-time work experience. And another requirement here is that you have to have a bachelor's degree. They changed that requirement as of 2007. The experience, though, can be gained at any time prior to taking the exam, 10 years prior to taking the exam, and up to five years after. So it doesn't mean that I pass my national certification exam, which is actually this weekend, and I have to wait three years to do the marks. If I've been working in the industry for three years, I, I'm, I'm good. As soon as I pass the exam, I can be considered a, a CFP and, and use it on my business cards. Now, the CFP board, you know, not Kaplan determines what is and qualifies for experience. Basically, you have to be working in some aspect of financial planning, working with individuals. 
You can be singularly focused in your practice, like I mentioned, a CPA that only does individual tax returns. Um, but the board will, will determine what the experience is for you. You have to submit that once you complete the exam. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to call the board at the number that I've listed here. Lastly, of the four E's, and probably the most important, is that there is a code of ethics and professional responsibility. There's practice standards that you must adhere to. And basically, it demonstrates to the public this is their mission, that you've agreed to provide advice, financial planning advice, in the client's best interest. That gives you that credibility that we talked about in some of the previous slides, to be able to go out into the marketplace and say, I've been tested, and I can provide you this advice, and I have your best interest at heart. So um, very important aspect of the overall, the overall certification.